Yeah, we're back on a Monday morning. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think, Te Think Tech. It's a 10 o'clock clock. Uh, here we are to talk about the middle way uh, with uh, our co-host Chang Wang and our guest Carlos Sione. Uh, and they join us to discuss, um, and this is very important, um, the technology. Let me get this right. I'm looking at it now. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's expert opinions on education and technology. Uh, Carlos is a, what do you call it? An, an education entrepreneur. Is that a fair statement of it, Carlos? That is a fair statement, yes, sir. Welcome to the show. And Thank Shane, you. welcome to you to the show. Uh, as always, can you please describe the scope of our discussion and can you introduce our special guest? Absolutely, aloha. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Jay and Carlos. It is my honor to introduce my good friend and a former colleague. Carlos and I have known each other for 15 years. We used to work for the same company. He was senior executive, and he is one of the hardest working person, if not the, hard, the hardest working person and the smartest person I ever know. He, he knew inside out, out not only how to survive and function well in a corporate America, but uh, how to, how to, uh, he had the terrific uh, exit strategy of a corporate America, because sometimes you feel that corporate America become your small world and you cannot get out of it. And I have to confess, I followed Carlos, Carlos steps, uh, step by step. Uh, Carlos exit corporate America, and then shortly after, I did same. Carlos materialized his concept and built his own company. I materialized my concept and co-built a uh, team as well. So I learned a lot from Carlos and how to uh, be a team worker and how to materialize a concept. He founded a company called Estampora. It's a language learning platform and app. It's become extremely popular and successful uh, for the foreign language learning. So I'm very eager to hear the updates. I've been monitoring his development, his company development for the past few years, but I look forward to, to hear updates. And I also have a few burning questions about the recent, from the recent news, I would like to ask Carlos. Okay, we'll make it a cliffhanger. It's a cliffhanger what your questions are going to be. So Carlos, my question to you is, why? Why start extempore? Yes. Uh, you know, I, when people ask of entrepreneurs the, the why question, the, answer, the temptation is always to give a lofty answer. Uh, you know, you want to just fix the problem and make everything better or whatever. I wanted to have my own company. I, I wanted to have something I could call mine. I've always been an entrepreneur since I was a child. Um, been looking for a problem to solve for 10 years. And then my wife is a professor of linguistics at a university here in Minneapolis. And you know, once you identify the problem and you identify a solution for that problem, then everything else just naturally follows, right? What qualified you to be successful? Nothing, absolutely nothing. Success, <laughs> success, <laughs> success in a startup is pure uh, perseverance uh, against a lot. There's no, <clears throat> not, you're not, you, don't, you don't come pre-qualified. You just keep pushing and pushing and pushing and the things happen, right? And learn, learn from your mistakes. <laughs> I'm very impressed with that. But what you're really saying is that anyone could do it. <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyone can anyone can do it uh, if they stick around. That, that, you know, I've, you hear all these statistics. You know, nine ten out of nine out of ten uh, companies fail. Uh, companies don't fail. People give up. Right? Th th things get get tough, and people give up. And the ones that survive are not the smartest. They're just the ones that don't let go. So, what about creativity? You know, you got to be creative. You have, have to have a new idea every ten minutes. Uh, you have to, you know, do better than anybody in the competition or find a, a, a space which nobody has entered yet. Uh, what's your approach to that and why have you been successful in that? Um, you know, I know, another way to explain creativity, Jay, is, is 
frame it as trial and error. You know, you're not you're not imaginative. You don't have these brilliant ideas in the middle of the night. You're just constantly trying to you know new things and then screwing up and then trying again and then screwing up and then trying again. And from a distance, it looks it looks like creativity, but it's not. It's just the end of a long string of mistakes uh, where you end up with uh, with something that finally works, right? But there, there's no light bulb moment. It's it's a grind. It's, it's just keep going, keep going, an iterative process until things just click in. <laughs> You're gonna stick with it or sell it? Um, for now, we're gonna stick uh, stick with it. You know, it's a uh, there's about a billion people learning a language in the world right now, um, and we have you know less than two million. So we have a uh, we have a long way to go still for world from, domination. From a, <laughs> well, that's what we're talking about. From a customer point of view, what's the special sauce? Uh, well, why would I take extempor ahead of another company? And Lord knows there are a lot of companies trying to teach you languages these days. Some of them are more aggressive than others. So we, you know, what makes us, the reason why you would choose uh, extempore over somebody else is because there's nobody else right now. Um, you know, we are still in, in a greenfield uh, space. Um, we don't teach a language. We are a tool for language teachers. So our job is to make a language teacher's uh, life better and easier, which inevitably results in a better outcome for the student. Right? So ultimately what we do is we solve a logistical challenge. Um, teachers have too many students. You know, an average load in the US for a K-12 uh, teacher is about 120 students. If I'm teaching French or English or German or Hawaiian, um, and I have 120 students, if I want to speak with every one of my students for five minutes a day, five minutes, so they get five minutes of a speaking practice, that's 600, 600 minutes. So I mean, that's 10 hours of my day so that my students get 2.5 minutes of speaking practice realistically, right? Um, so that's what's so broken and so challenging for the language uh, the language teaching is that uh, students don't have the time so extempore is a tool that allows them to ensure practice ensure sounds in a way that's very very convenient for both the teacher and the student so before we started uh, i asked you you know what about the technology here is this an online play or is this a, a classroom system uh, what, what is it and how do you use yeah go ahead T tell Both. us about that yeah so that's the, the beauty the beauty of uh, the cloud right it's uh some schools have it in a in a computer lab on campus um some have give the students devices some use it on the student's device it doesn't matter you know you have a username and password you can log into extempore from the computer lab and then finish your homework at home on your mom's laptop right or in the car on your phone it doesn't really matter because it follows the student how do you um, handle all those students within the, the course of a, uh, the amount of time available? I mean, what, what do you give to the teacher uh, to, to enable the teacher to accelerate the learning process? We do, so what we do is two things. Mainly we facilitate the process, right? So the teacher can, instead of meeting with 120 students and asking the same question 120 times, they ask a question once on extempore and the students answer on their own time, right? So that's cut my time investment as a teacher dramatically. Um, but then we also have a lot of pre-made activities and pre-made uh, tasks that a teacher can just pull in and use with their students and then review on their own time. Mm, okay. And then we have a lot of you know time saving. I can play my students' responses at double double speed because they speak very slowly, right? So it's always a cumulative process of time savings uh, for the teacher. But there always is a teacher. I think that's They're, what I hear you saying. Oh, there always is a teacher. We are not in a world where we can replace the teacher yet. The teacher is, <laughs> is, is a critical part of uh, education. Before, before we go uh, to the cliffhanger questions that Chang is waiting so patiently to ask you, <clears throat> uh, I, I wanna ask about the languages. You know, uh, you go to these various um, uh, language uh, learning programs, hither and yon, and, and they will offer many, many, many languages. And some of them are, you know, some of the lessons in one language are better than some of the lessons in another language. And I always wonder, you know, how how it um, how it works to learn Croatian. Um, so <laughs> my question to you is, what languages do you select for this? Do you select any language particularly, um, or all languages? I mean, you have there's a demand out there. You've got to satisfy parents want kids, you know, I know a, um, she's a Filipino woman. She decided her kid had to be in a Chinese immersion school 
this is in Portland. Uh, so she said, well, okay, I don't know of any immersion schools for young kids. I will establish one. And she did successfully. And I, I just, that was extraordinary that she could do that. But that was the demand for Mandarin. Um, how do you meet that kind of demand? So we follow more than need in that sense, right? If I have a teacher of Hawaiian, which we do, who wants to use extemporary teach Hawaiian, the platform is there for them. The platform is in itself language agnostic. And what's interesting is we actually gravitate towards what's called less commonly taught languages. Now, if I teach Spanish, if I teach French, there's textbooks, there's websites, there's videos. If I teach Tagalog, or if I teach some African dialect, there is nothing, right? So we, right now we, we see about 30 students being, uh, sorry, 30 languages being taught on extempore. Um, the Minnesota Department of Education, for example, uses extempore to assess for all their for less commonly taught languages. So if, I, if a child in uh, Minnesota speaks Ojibwe at home, you know, an indigenous language here, and they want to prove to the state that they are bilingual and get something called the seal of biliteracy assessment, a stamp, so a, a certificate on their high school diploma that says, no, this kid is bilingual, they will use extempore to assess for that, for that language. And so that's the beauty of, of a tool that's completely language agnostic is any language, we'll, we'll, give it, we'll give it to you, right? You know, I have noticed, Carlos, that there's an increasing number of apps on telephone, uh, on phones, and on computers, which will do simultaneous translation. You can speak into it and it will write it out in Croatian. Um, you can speak into it in Croatian, it'll write it out in English. And you can speak to it in Croatian, it'll speak back to you in English. Uh, now these are not 100% effective yet, but they're going that way. And they're using artificial intelligence. Um, and if I'm you know, in a shop, uh, in the capital of Croatia, what's the capital of Croatia, uh, th then uh, I will be able to talk to the shopkeeper in a fairly sophisticated linguistic exchange using my cell phone. Isn't that a serious competition for you? Isn't that the way things are going now? So you will be able to order a coffee in Croatian you are not gonna be able to crack a subtle joke in Croatian, <laughs> right? You're not gonna be able to make, I guess, you know, intelligent commentary about the, the Croatian society using your phone. I have no doubt that technology like that will put us all out of business and include myself and the teachers 50 years from today. Um, learning a language is not just learning the words. Learning a language is learning a culture. Learning a language is learning the environment. Learning a language is, you know, thinking uh, like the language you're trying to learn, right? And I can make jokes with, you know, a colleague here in the US that I cannot make um, back at home in Spain and the other way around, right? And that is what learning a language brings. It's not just a translation piece. Anybody can translate, but that's the easy part. Is navigating a culture, is being what's called functionally bicultural, right? Moving two cultures together uh, and navigate that. We're a long, long, long way from that still. Yes. Uh, Chang, you've been so patient. And I, I, for myself, you know, the other side of my brain is waiting for your cliffhanger questions. So this is a moment where you might, you might want to pose them to Carlos. Very kind of you, Jay. I've been enjoying to hear your uh, conversation. The first of you, Jay, it's the uh, capital of Croatia is Zagreb. The city of Zagreb, the capital and the chief city. That'll be on the final exam, everybody. Right. Which we can and do on extempore at your convenience. <laughs> right. I have a couple of questions, but first two questions for Carlos are related. Uh, they are they are related. Uh, they are related to each other. So I'm proud to say that I found a Chinese name for Carlos Song. He has a beautiful boy and a beautiful girl, and he sent both of them. To Chinese immersion schools. And so my first question is why? I never really directly ask you this. Why did you think the Chinese immersion school is better than French immersion school and or uh, Spanish immersion school? But probably you can do that at home. And then the second question is related is uh, considering the recent divorce of these two countries and uh, in the foreseeable future, 
will be more and more uh, separation. And do you regret the decision to send your kids to Chinese immersion school? That's a, that's a loaded question, but I'll, I'll do my best to answer it. Uh, no, I do not regret um, sending our kids to Chinese immersion school. Uh, when people ask, why did you send them to Chinese immersion school? My, my answer is, why not? Um, you know, the fact that my kids were six and eight right now can sit on the little butts at a school and essentially absorb Chinese um, and speak Chinese fluently in a few years at zero effort is magic to me. Right? Um, and my, we go to a charter school here in Minneapolis called Yinghua Academy. It's a fantastic school, public, doesn't cost me any money. Uh, you know, and every year, this time of the year, I, I think that the the fact that I can take my kids to bilingual school, make my kids trilingual, trilingual at zero effort uh, with fantastic teachers in small classrooms uh, it is magic to me. And it's, it's a testament of how far we've come uh, as a society, right? Um, as to you know, the specific why, there's a lot of reasons, uh, a lot of cognitive advantages to speaking multiple languages, as you know, uh, and the more apart those languages the better um you know i think it's not you know my kids speak spanish at home english everywhere and chinese in in, in uh in school those are three separate ways of thinking and three separate ways of operating that's good for their brains right that's, that's gonna build a set of connections in their brains that they wouldn't otherwise um there is also a and to be careful here a slightly political consideration for me um I am I am an optimist. So I don't think uh, the countries have divorced. I think I think China is rising, and you know, good for them as they should. Right? I come from a former empire, so I know everything about rising and falling again. Um, so it, you know, on a political sense, it's not bad for my kids to uh, to also speak Chinese. Uh, you know, if mom and dad divorce, you want to spend some time in each in each house, right, and keep the relationship with both. Um, even if, so, if you're right, it's not a bad thing. Um, but I, you know, I do think China is the future. Um, for good or bad, I think China is the future, and and I want my kids to be able to navigate uh, three cultures. And if you add the amount of people that speak Chinese in the world plus English plus, plus Spanish, my children will be able to communicate with about ninety percent of the world's population in their own language. That is, that that will just open the world uh, like nothing else. So you want to ask your yeah. second question now? Yeah, allow me a quick uh, comment before I ask another question. It's last time Carlos and his family uh, come, uh, came to my house for dinner party, and uh, his son and daughter speak perfect Chinese, Chinese Mandarin without any accent uh, to us and to our Chinese dogs. And because our dogs are very talkative, and his son just uh, look at uh, my elder dog and said, and speak in perfect, perfect Mandarin. Shut up and say the dog's name. <laughs> and and just, I would both my wife and I were, were totally overwhelmed by it and were, were was stunned by such a, a perfect you know pronunciation that is extremely rare for the uh, non Chinese speakers. And you, as you can hear, I speak English with heavy accent, even after 20 years in the United States. But a quick question for you, uh, Carlos, and in, in what language do you think your children are dreaming right now? <laughs> uh, we often wonder, they, you know, so first of all, a six year old's brain and a 40 year old's brain are, are not the same, right? You know, my, my daughter who's six just absorb everything instantly, perfectly. There's no, there's no, <clears throat> there's nothing to confuse her, right? There's nothing there yet. Um, they are at a really fascinating stage where they will use the first language that comes to them. So they are very happy to um, mix languages in the same sentence. Um, you know, they will, uh, they, they will start a sentence in Spanish, continue in, in English, and if the only word they know is in Chinese, then they'll finish in Chinese. Because if you think about it, you know, their world is very segmented, right? The way we speak to them at, in, at home, the vocabulary we use as parents at home in Spanish 
is very different than the vocabulary they use in school and the very use very different than the vocabulary they use on the street with their friends right um so it's not there's much less overlap that you would think so if they're speaking in english and the only word they, 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 the only word they know is in chinese they'll just blurt it on in chinese and hope for the best right because in their mind everybody should speak chinese like they do because it's just so easy <laughs> so no okay my second question is uh recently chinese government have this uh policy change so after school private tutoring including language learning has been banned so in in the past few decades chinese uh parents after the school as for curriculum activities have been full for chinese children so they go to piano classes, they go to uh, English learning, French learning, they go to calligraphy, and but most importantly, they go to exam preparation training courses. Now the Chinese government banned all of them overnight. So obviously uh, many people will lose their job, but uh, uh, some parents are happy, some parents are unhappy. The happy parents said, okay, before that policy change, we cannot afford buying these private tutoring classes and we cannot afford pay for educational apps so we now everybody on the equal footing and uh, so we have to our children will just study hard in school there's no after school midnight snacks for the rich kids and some parents are very unhappy they said we want our children to be fully educated. We want to provide the best of, of education opportunities and the best technology uh, we can afford. And if they need, we will buy them an iPad Pro, we will buy them, pay for the apps, and we will pay for any private tutoring classes online or in person. And so this policy change is, is fair uh, on a societal level, but it's unfair to our children. And it's the second part of the question is already related because now the English learning is optional for Chinese children, for elementary school children. It used to be for my generation in, in 1980s, uh, when we go to uh, went to uh, elementary school, English learning was optional. And then the government made it mandatory for all elementary school children for the past few decades, and but recently they changed it back to optional. So I want to hear uh, Carlos' comments on uh, all these new recent developments because you think that China uh, is rising, but uh, look at those policy uh, changes. What's your comments and gut feeling about this? So, so <clears throat> I have a lot. I have a lot of thoughts about that. As a matter of fact, you know, it seems to me. Um, that China is struggling, trying to decide who they want to be, right? Um, removing English classes from uh, an elementary classroom um, makes them sound like the US, right? It's almost this mindset that we're already <laughs> empire, so we don't need it. We don't need to learn another language, right? If you want to talk to me, speak Chinese. Um, there's a bit of that arrogance. You know, if you think about the US, the US language teaching is compared to Europe, for example, um, it's minimal. You know, in Europe, every student speaks, uh, learns a second or third language in the U.S. Only a percentage of them, right? And that that's that's the empire mindset that you know, talk to me in my language because I'm the boss, right? Um, I grew up in Spain. Spain still has that legacy thinking where you know, if you want to talk to me, you should learn Spanish. Right? We're not empire anymore, but they still think they are sometimes. So it's, it seems to me on one side that China is starting to think as a as a big boy now, and you know. They don't see a need to uh, to communicate in other languages, which is maybe that's that's just the way uh, the way we evolve as humans. Um, the whole crackdown on on uh, tutoring, you know, it's almost the other side of it. I mean, it's made on the grounds of equity or stated uh, to be on the grounds of equity. Uh, I'm not sure if it is or, or that's just an excuse for a, a bigger picture of a crackdown on technology and and uh, you know, too much power from technology companies, which is the same debate we're having in this country about Twitter and Facebook 
and so on, right? Uh, but it seems to me that the China, you know, it's it's a fast evolving country that's trying to decide uh, to decide who they are. As a technology educational technology executive, I don't think it's a good idea to crack down on technology companies. I have to say that. Uh, I would rather we avoid that at all costs. Um, you know, I definitely don't. It doesn't sound to be good policy to just uh, you know punch the table and and get half a million people out of a, out of a job overnight. That's not that's not the way it should be done. Um, but yeah, it's 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 interesting to watch China as as the father of uh, two Chinese speakers. Uh, it's funny to watch. You know, it's interesting to watch uh, to watch that evolution as well and see see what China will be twenty years from today when my kids are out in the job market. Right, it won't be what it is today. My, my reaction, uh, uh, Chang and Carlos, is that the, th that's a move calculated to control the message. <clears throat> uh, they can control the schools, you know, what the teachers uh, say in the schools, um, but they can't control the tutors very well. And so the, you cut the tutors out. So now you use the schools as a way to control the message. And so there's no there's no contamination right. of foreign ideas, what have you, into that. It's really, and it's really too bad. It reflects not only arrogance, but this kind of special aggressive, uh, what did you call it before, Chang? Divorce mentality is what it is. Um, and, and this is really problematic because on the one hand, Carlos, as you have mentioned, to learn a language well is to learn the culture of the other place. And if you have more people in more places learning the cultures of more other places, you have a better world because you understand how it is across the border you understand what it's like to live in the other country and um you know the good the bad what have you but it it enables you to understand and therefore it brings the world together and if yeah, we don't do that on the other side of it uh, l'autre côté right the other side of it is if we don't do that then we don't understand and it, it brings the world further apart yeah not only that on a selfish standpoint it gives you the upper hand, right? If I'm trying to sell you something, I'll be much more effective selling it to you in English than if uh, I try to force you to learn Spanish uh, to buy it from me, right? So uh, as a country that is able to understand and interact with other countries in their own languages, to me, that's a huge advantage, right? Um, they can't force the world to learn Chinese, um, but they are. I think they're losing out if they don't understand the American culture. Um, that, that's a net loss for them and for the world, as you said. I want to go back to uh, the Filipino girl who established the immersion school in Portland for Mandarin. And for that matter, your kids in a Mandarin immersion school. And it's very impressive what happened there. Um, you know, what, what really is the future on this? If the relationship between China and the U.S. is declining, degrading, you know, getting mm, mm, more contentious, uh, then as a parent or as a person, um, do I want to know Mandarin? Uh, you know, in 20 years ago, Chang, it was all the rage. A lot of people, they wanted to learn Mandarin because they thought the future was bright and cohesive and, you know, tolerant, and there would be a huge connection between the U.S. and China. Uh, a lot of people don't feel that way anymore, and, and it's on both sides both sides of the issue. But but query, um, you know, where are we going with this? Uh, is it important? Is it still important? What would you advocate to a parent now, given the fact that two countries are moving apart? There's no, there is no downside as far as I can tell, right? I mean, uh, there is never a downside. But you have to, to make the argument of relevance. Yeah, no, no, I understood. But what I'm saying is there's no there is no argument in knowing too much. Um, whether, you know, if things stay friendly and I I hope and I pray that they will, then I think my 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 kids, any any child that speaks uh, Chinese will have an advantage in the, the job market. Uh, if things were to stay unfriendly, my kids are American first, right? It's not bad for the US to have people that speak the uh, the other side's language fluently and understand that culture. Right. Um, so to me, relevant or not, uh, there's absolutely no downside to, to learning another language and understanding another culture. If you don't want to say and brag about it, then don't. Uh, but that's something no, nobody can take away from you. Yeah. Um, one, one last thing I'd like to get into um, is uh, the linguistic approach. You spoke of your wife as a, as a, ling a linguistics professor and so forth. 
Uh, and you also spoke, Carlos, of this um, um, the really fabulous kind of expression to start a sentence in one language and then end it in another. Uh, that, that means a lot. It means a lot psychologically. It means a lot in terms of a worldview, of a view of humanity. Uh, there's a lot to say for, for doing that. And Chang, I'm sure you do it. And I would guess by bucks that your kids do it too. I would even guess that your dog does it. You're, I, you're... <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. My dogs are bilingual, by the way. <laughs> of course they, they were are. Born, they were born in China and immigrants to the United States. <laughs> and they're absolutely loving it. But I really, I really appreciate our conversation today because as a, as a, a bilingual speaker and uh, who has been spent a lot of time in education sector, also in, in technology sector of the corporate America, I just feel uh, I feel strong echo of everything you have uh, said so far. So, you know, the language, particularly the language learning, is so vitally important for 21st century. And and on the larger scale, the the more the you speak a foreign language. And you not only begin to understand the culture and history behind the language, but most importantly, you begin to develop an empathy for the people. So, you know, statistics, there are very strong uh, sociology statistics, you know, show that the more, the more foreign language speakers you have, the more peaceful your state and country will be because you don't automatically label the other side, other people as enemy or even animal or non-human. So you it's so that if you don't hear, understand the language, you hear on the TV, you see that people blah 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 blah. Oh, what are they talking about? They are just, you know, it's not us. It's there are others. So the the we we should definitely encourage. Uh, language learning at all cost. It, it's a really uh, uh, a shame that we don't have a lot of mandatory foreign language learning courses in in most major countries as well. And the technology definitely is a tool uh, for uh, to achieve this uh, to achieve this goal. Well, that's a problem, yes. Carlos. How do you, how do you must think about that? How do you do that? We live in a time of isolation. I would bet if you went to the American Congress and uh, asked them to speak in another language, uh, they wouldn't find a lot of response. If you asked them whether they had passports to visit other countries, uh, you probably wouldn't find a lot of response. Uh, we're in isolation mode. Uh, how do you change the direction of that? I, I think for every action, there's a reaction, Jay. Um, I think we were in isolation mode until Trump. I think that the, the pendulum is swinging in the other direction now. Uh, there is a big bill in, in Congress with bipartisan, part, bipartisan support that adds a very significant amount of funding for language teaching um, in the K-12 and the higher ed. Mm. Um, well, you know, um, there is there are two Americas. Uh, I think we saw that. We've seen that in the last four years. Um, there is there's an America that wants to isolate and wants to less to know more to know less and there's a very open very smart very educated America out there as well and I, I do want to think that that second is the majority. Um, again, I am an optimist. You don't start a company if you don't are not an irrational optimist. Uh, so I do I do believe in the future of uh, of this country and I do think there's a lot of very very smart people that want to do the right thing. So we'll count we'll counter some of that uh, temptation at the risk of. At the risk of having you say something you said before, let me uh, offer you the opportunity to leave your message with our viewing audience. What would you want them to remember? You know, I think that the takeaway is is that language teaching, I think, is important. That the language teaching is more than language teaching. Language teaching is is culture, is empathy, is being able to relate uh, to others, is being able to understand and uh, the world in a, in a very very different way. Right, and you can achieve that with technology. You can achieve that with funding. You can achieve that, but it all it all goes to the same place, which is knowledge and education. That that's what's changing the world. That's what's always changed the world, uh, and you know, playing a small part of that, I think it's a it's a, it's an honor for me. That strikes me that it's really um, it's a strategic resource for the country 
them as a country to be able to speak multiple languages. You know, Absolutely. they keep talking about all these people that the government, the military wants to save in Afghanistan. And a good number of people um, that they want to save are, quote, interpreters. Uh, and I think that tells us we don't have a lot of interpreters in this country trained to be trained by the military to be interpreters. Uh, and my reaction is we would have been better off uh, and we would be better off now if we had our own interpreters who understood Most. multiple languages around the world. Uh, okay. Chang, I want to offer you the opportunity to close. Can you do that? Thank you so much, Jay. Thank you, Carlos, for coming on the show. That I cannot agree with you more with what just uh, your, your closing remarks. But I want to close uh, uh, my, my part with a quote from one of our former presidents, that which I call in Carlos' optimism, nothing wrong about America cannot be cured by what's wrong, what's right about America. And I also want to twist this quote a little bit that no biases or uh, prejudice cannot be cured by foreign language learning. <laughs> I, li I like that, Chang. I like that too. That's very good. <clears throat> Thank you, Chang Wang. Thank you, Carlos Sione. Really appreciate Thank you, you so coming much. around this morning. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for the opportunity, Jay. Thank you, Chang. Aloha and namaste. Yeah. Bye. Yeah.